Okay, John chapter 6, we're going to, Lord willing, we're going to be finishing the chapter tonight. Um, I want to think about, you know, our youth these days find it very hard sometimes to make decisions. They are so afraid, and some of us adults can, uh, can identify with that, of, of making decisions. We're afraid to make uh, mistakes. And so, uh, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and here we are, and it's an awful place to be whether you're going to buy a vehicle or where you're going to go to school or buy a dress or buy this or that. This decision making sometimes can be just maddening. Uh, and when people don't make decisions, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress. And so, yes, no, yes, no. And it's an awful place to be. Um, and sometimes the, the lack of decision making actually shows immaturity. Uh, and when we get to a place where we need to make a decision, but because of fear we don't make a decision, and that happens for a period of time, we begin to get irritable. Irritable, where we can get angry at just about anything or at anyone. Because we ourselves, there's turmoil and there's no peace inside. And so... We just become irritated and somebody says something. Rawr! We don't want to respond, but we do. And uh, that's just one of the consequences of not being able to make decisions out of fear. And sometimes it's wisdom to wait on a decision or can't need more information, whatever. But if, but if it's out of fear and immaturity, then we start complaining. And um, this thing about making decisions, this is the way the Lord made us. When a child is born, they don't make any decisions. But when the child grows up to be 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 35, 40 years and older, we don't expect them to not make any decisions and just sit there until somebody else makes a decision for them. No. You know, we need to be making decisions. And the Lord does the same thing with us. That we need to be making decisions. But it's scary. So what to do? In this passage, in John 6, it's about Jesus challenging uh, decisions to follow him and then encouraging the decision to follow him. Uh, in Joshua, you might remember, some of you might remember, Joshua 24, uh, you know, Joshua says, people, in fact, let me, let, let's read that passage, uh, Joshua chapter 24, uh, Joshua 24 in the Old Testament. Um, Joshua 24 and verse 15 it says if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which, are your, which your fathers served which were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And there's something very powerful about making a decision, a very uh, direct, intentional, I'm going to do this. And there's also something very powerful, listen to this, to verbalizing the decision. Sometimes if we make a decision, but we keep it to ourselves, and we don't tell anybody, it's kind of easy to change, no? Because nobody knows about it anyway. But if we verbalize it and somebody else hears it, like, okay, there's a, a strength behind a decision that we've made. And God has created us to make decisions. And uh, when we do not make decisions, we are not living, uh, reflecting God. God makes all kinds of decisions all the time. Eternal decisions, right? And judgments for eternity. And we were created to make decisions. And when we're not making decisions, we're not acting, we're not reflecting God. And we're not living to our potential. 
you know, uh, and as I said many times, fear keeps us from making decisions. The greatest decisions that we make are spiritual decisions. Are we going to follow the Lord or not? Um, are we going to pray or not? Uh, are we going to take care of our inside? Or are we just going to focus on the physical? You see. Uh, and when we focus on the interior of what's happening in our souls, then we are more in touch with what God is interested in. He's interested in the physical too. He takes care of us. But the inside, what's going on in the heart, in our minds and emotions and so forth. And we need to decide to go there. As we move along, we need to ask, well, where are we? Where am I really in decision making? Do I just focus on the physical? Do I just focus on the, on the financial, uh, uh, whether I have eyebrows or not, whether I have hair or not? <laughs> uh, or do I focus or do I look at my interior? What about Everybody else that I'm associated with. Do I just focus on the physical part of my wife? Do I just f uh, focus on the physical part of my children? Where they have all the clothes that they need and, 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 and the house and everything. Do I just focus on that? And not raise questions. What's going on on the inside? You know, what's going on inside? Uh, you know, I asked Desiree, David, David, are you okay, son? You, I saw the way you reacted over there. What? What's going on, on the inside, son? And great conversations come out of that. Sometimes I have no solutions or anything, but to, to be focused on what's going on, on the inside. Where are you? Where are you in your relationships, in yourself? You see? What we find in this passage, in John chapter 6, from verse 60 to 71, is this. That Jesus, by his sovereign authority, and already we don't like that. For somebody to have sovereignty over us, no. <laughs> we react. But Jesus, by his sovereign authority, challenges us. And then encourages in our decisions to follow him. Number one, are we going to follow him or not? And when we do decide to follow him... The encouragement that is there that he wants to give to us. And that's what we find in this passage. Uh, if you will remember what has happened that in the previous couple of chapters, uh, it's tension. There's a lot of tension that's happening. Uh, let me just go through some of these things. So the tension that is there... Um, Jesus had claimed that he came from heaven. John chapter 6, verse 38. I'm the one that came from heaven. It's like, you're just a human being. What do you mean? He's claiming that he came from heaven. All right? Um, he also points out that God, God has absolutely authority who gets saved and who does not. I don't like that. But God... God is absolutely sovereign. Now at the same time, he gives us choices and he sent his son, so we have to balance that, but the reality is he is absolutely sovereign. And we can become angry with that and reject, or we can bow down and say, man, God, how awesome are you that you are both sovereign and yet at the same time, at the same time, you provide everything that we need and we can make a decision whether we're going to follow or not. Wow, God, wow. And so, but there creates tension inside of us. And Jesus says, number one, I come from heaven. Number two, God has absolutely authority who gets saved. Uh, and then here in the previous paragraph, um, you want to be saved, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Oh, my goodness, what is that? And so you get this again, these people are like, what is this? It's a lot of tension. In chapter 3, he turned the water to wine. Uh, and then chapter 4, he healed the official's son. And then 
chapter 5, he, he fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then he walked on water. <laughs> like, goodness. And now, to all of his disciples, he's told them, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Oh. And isn't that the way God works so much of the time? That he gives us things that we have no idea what he's doing or how he's doing, and we want to scream. What, God, what, why? I mean, don't you find that sometimes in your life? That you get confused by what, how God is doing or what he's not doing, what he seems to be supposed to be doing? God, why do you allow this immoral person to get away with it? I mean, I, I raise that question all the time. And it's, it's grievous to see so much wrong. And yet at the same time, God blesses. God gives what we need. God gives us tastes of his goodness and his sovereign power. And it's like, yes, thank you, Lord. And then we turn around like, ah, <laughs> why are you allowing that? And here we go, right? And so... There's a lot of tension in all this. God has all, or Jesus had all these followers, and there were some followers that are just superficial. And he's weeding them out, right? He goes through the process of saying, are you going to follow or not? When you get a little confusing in your Christian life, are you going to follow or not? Are you going to trust me or not? And a lot of his disciples were being sifted through uh, some of them were deep, some of them were shallow. Uh, and through all that he had done, the disciples began to realize, this is no regular rabbi. This guy is from God. I mean, they had to. With all that he had done and said and done. I mean, just amazing. Uh, he claims for himself and the claim that he made that he is God, that he's equal with God the Father, Wow. Man, you better reflect on what he's saying. Because he either is God or he is crazy. One of the two. No in between. <laughs> you know, and if we just want to be superficial, I'm like, ah, whatever. And you skip it. And now it's too hard of a saying, you know what? Bye. And that's what many of the disciples did in this passage, right? Like, uh, you know, um, and so then in verse 60, um, therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, when they said, Jesus said, you got to eat my blood and drink my flesh. <sighs> when they heard that, what did they say? This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? The word there for difficult, it's a harsh word. It's not, listen, it's not intellectually difficult. It is a harsh kind of violence involved here. Eat flesh and drink blood? This is a harsh saying. Uh, and so, sometimes there is mystery in religion, mystery in the things of God, mystery in Christianity. And most of us can accept mystery. Or well, many of us do. So sometimes the problem is not mystery. The problem is this. That we're going to be challenged in our morality. And we're going to be challenged on our limitations. I cannot figure out all of life. I can't. Where did it come from? What happens after we stop breathing? Where's the beginning of the whole universe? We can... Theorize, but in the final analysis, we don't know. We don't know. We're limited. I was talking to my wife. She works in the hospital. And uh, there's a lot of dilemmas that they come. You know why? Because sometimes the doctors, 
don't want to admit their limitations. Take, uh, they can't come, bring to themselves to, to the point of saying, look man, we can do nothing else. You're going to die. Oh no, we can try this and this and this. But never, come on. We're limited. I was telling my wife, you know, in the medical school, there needs to be a whole course on doctor's limitations. We're all limited. But sometimes when God presents us with certain situations, we don't want to admit that we're limited. Our intellect is so puny. And we have to. And so these are harsh statements that Jesus is making. And he's challenging us whether we're going to trust or not. And so now Jesus, from that situation, uh, picks it up and he challenges them on their decision to follow him. Look, you need to follow. You need to follow. But look at the way he does it. Verse 61. But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? A couple of things. When it says that he was conscious, the word there is he knew. Literally, knowing, Jesus knew uh, that they were grumbling. Just the omniscient, omniscient that he knew everything, that's God, that's Jesus. He knows. We don't have to do anything. He knows what's going on in our minds, in our hearts. Jesus knew. And then he says, is this causing you to stumble? The word there is for scandalized. Are you being scandalized? And by scandalized meaning you're going to fall away from the faith? You're being tempted to fall away from the faith? Isn't that what happens in our lives as well? Something happens and we're uh, tempted to not go to church anymore. Not pray anymore. I'm not going to follow anymore because... God is not working the way he's supposed to. That's being scandalized. And she's saying, what I said, is that causing you to, to be scandalized? To stumble? I know what's going on inside of you. So, and this is a, a note from John, the gospel writer. Jesus knowing, he, John, the gospel writer, is bringing out the reality the truth that Jesus knows. He knows. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's bringing it out. And now Jesus, by that question, um, wants to surface what's inside of them. It's not that Jesus needs information. He already knows. But he wants to surface what's in the disciples. And you and I need that so much. We're going through life, and we're not even aware of what's happening to us. We're just like, and then somebody, something happens, like, oops, I'm pushed this way, okay. Oops, I'm pushed this way, and here we are. We're not even aware of what's happening inside. And when we're not aware of what's happening inside, we don't make good decisions. If we make any decisions at all. And so Jesus is saying, I need to surface what's inside of you. Let me ask you a question. It's not that he needed information. He wanted to surface what was inside of them. Is this causing you to be scandalized? Um, and then verse 62. <laughs> what then if you see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? What's the point? If you can't believe when I'm talking to you of things of how God works and who I am, What's going to happen when I do things and you don't know what to do? You have no idea. I'm going back to heaven. Are you going to stop believing? Are you going to stop following? Because you don't understand? Point. You need to trust me. You need to trust the sovereign work of God. The way he does things. Even when you do not understand. What's going to happen if I go back to where I was before? Go 
Oops, maybe the issue is I'm not trusting. That's what Jesus was surfacing in the disciples. It's not a matter of understanding everything. It's a matter of trusting the Lord in everything, whether we understand or not. So that's what he's trying to surface in them and, and show them. And then he says, um, verse 63, uh, it is the spirit, and in most of your translations, it's capitalized. You see that in your translation? Is it ca capitalized in your, in your translation? And, and usually indicating that that's, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And it could be that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words which I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And it could be that. That God gives us the spirit. The spirit is the one that makes life. Literally, the Greek there is uh, life-making. I think rather than, instead of talking about the Holy Spirit, I think he's talking about the spirit as in the body, uh, the, the human being, we have a body and we have the spirit, right? And the spirit is the one that really counts, so to speak. Now, the body counts, of course, but it's the spirit that, that is the life-making element of who we are, right? And isn't that the case? If we all feel the day has gone really, really bad and our spirit is down, it doesn't matter what you do physically, you feel miserable, but at the same time, on the other hand, we can be physically all tired or whatever, and all of a sudden, we hear great news, something that comes to our ears, great news, and like, <sighs> life comes to us. <laughs> like, I'm ready to run a marathon, man. This is so awesome. Why? Because the spirit is life-making, life-producing. And I take it because... He's saying, guys, what I'm telling you are spiritual things. You see? And it's there because he contrasted with the flesh. Does he not? The flesh profits nothing. The words. Words are non-physical. The words, the truth that I have spoken to you are spiritual spirit or spiritual and that is life you see it's where life is produced right God created Adam and it was uh, made him out of mud when did he become a living being when God breathed into him and he became a living being what happens when we die? The spirit is gone. And the body's just laying there, cold. Buried in the ground. Let the worms take it. Right? But the spirit, and I think that's what Jesus is saying here. Uh, the words that I'm saying, with the inside of you, the non-physical part of you. Uh, that's what I'm addressing. Uh, the body profits nothing. But it's not a matter about the intellect. It's not the matter, if, are you going to trust or not? That's the question. Verse 64, but there are some of you who do not believe, and that's the issue. That's the issue. You do not believe. Uh, for Jesus knew, there it is again, right? The same Greek word in verse 61, but Jesus was conscious, conscious of all the same Greek word as in verse 64. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. John, the gospel writing, look, Jesus is omniscient, omniscient. He knows everything. You see? So you can trust him. He knows everything. You see? 
And not only does he know everything, he's also challenging them to um, trust in God's ways, even though God's ways are mysterious so much of the time. We can't figure it out, figure him out, which is maddening for us who got to stay in control. <laughs> We're the, like those tiny little ants that we have at our house. You know, we have poison and we kill thousands of them. But those little ants are, they think they, okay, they got the universe under control. Looking at them. We're the same way so much of the time. We want to control life, everything. Jesus says, stop, stop it. Because God is the one that is in control. He says in verse 65, and he was saying to them, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless he has been granted to him from my father, from the father. God is totally sovereign. You are not. I don't like that. You know that? I don't like that. I'd rather have some control myself a little bit, Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus looks down like, you're pretty small there, guy. I need a microscope to find you. <laughs> but we think we have to have control. You see? Jesus is saying, God is absolutely sovereign. Rest. Rest. You see? So he challenges them. To trust in his sovereignty and his knowledge. He knows everything and he's absolutely sovereign. And now he's going to encourage them to keep following, even when they don't understand. And how does he do that? Well, let's look. Verse 66. Now he's going to encourage them in their decision to follow him. As a result of this, uh, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. They said, nah, this is too tough, man. This is too much to believe. No, uh -uh, I got life in the control. <laughs> okay, try it again for the umpteenth million times. See if you have control. They withdrew. So Jesus said to the twelve, uh, you do not want to go away also, do you? And once again, it's not that Jesus needed more information. Or it wasn't that Jesus were like, like some of the parents. Oh, please, son, don't do that. Oh, don't, don't. Oh, I need you. I'm going to die without you. If you do this, oh. No. That's why you're going to leave Jesus as well. Like, no. He wanted to surface in them and strengthen their decision to have followed him. That's what he wanted to do. So in asking that question, it put them, blink, 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 am I going to leave or not? Am I going to leave or not? Decision time, and I've made a decision to follow him, but blink, 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 blink. I suspect that there was a few moments that Jesus just looked around. <laughs> Until finally something, somebody had to say something, and guess who it was? Peter. Peter. And look what happens. Verse 68. Simon Peter answered and said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Several things. Uh, Lord, we've heard all the charlatans. We heard all these religious leaders. You're the one that speaks truth. You're the one who has life of eternal life. Words of eternal life. You're the one. 
And because of that, I want you to note, in verse 69, believed and have come to know. Uh, in the original language, you have uh, verbs that are placed in certain tenses. And these are what called perfect tenses. And one of the perfect tenses, one of the characteristics of a perfect tense is this. Something that happened and has ongoing results. And they are both in the perfect. We have believed and had certain consequences to the, the fact that we believed. We have come to know, to know, we've known. And they have a certain consequences, Lord. Ongoing consequences. Um, here's another thing I want you to point out. We have come to know. Didn't we meet the issue of knowing already twice? Jesus knew, right? It says in verse 61, and Jesus knew, or conscience. Verse 64, and Jesus knew from the beginning, right? The word here, we have come to know, is a different Greek word. And the word there for know is the word of knowing intimately, knowing experientially. Sometimes it can be used for knowing sexual, sexual intercourse. I knew, I have experienced. Peter is saying, we've come to know, experience you. And it has had certain consequences. We've come to know you. And what have they come to know? That you are the Holy One of God. That's one of the highest titles in the Old Testament. You are the Holy One of God. And we have experienced that. It's not just head knowledge. I know all the knowledge who Jesus is and all this, but I haven't experienced him. Peter saying, we have come to believe and we have known. We have experienced you, that you are the Holy One of, of God. I want you to note the order, belief, and know. It is when we step forward in faith and trust in Christ that we're going to know, experience Him. Experience his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his compassion. Name it. But if we don't step forward in faith, we will not come to experience to know Christ. Did you catch the order? We have believed. And we have known. We've come to know. That you are the Christ. You are the Holy One of God. Jesus was not thrown off. I mean, isn't that great when somebody believes like that? Ooh, awesome. Awesome. And Jesus says, okay, you got the point. Now, let me tell you a few more things. Because you see, you got to remember that I know. I know. You see? Don't we get blinded? When we get to know somebody, we fall in love, or we're so enamored by their whatever. It's like, oh, they're perfect people. No, no, only God is perfect. And so Jesus goes on. Now, in verse 70, Jesus said, uh, answered them, did I myself not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is the devil. Oops. Don't ever forget. Because you've come to experience me. Don't think that now you don't need me anymore. Don't forget, I'm the one that chose you. I'm the one that cared enough to call you and show you and I chose you. And all of that solidifies for them 
encourages them to keep following Jesus because he knows. So when he says, now John adds in verse 71, now he meant Judas, the son of, uh, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, even though he heard everything and saw what Jesus did, was going to betray him. It's a little scary. It's a little scary. Because you and I have come to know Jesus. Probably. But we can walk away and betray Jesus. So Jesus is saying, listen. I want you to decide to follow me. And I want you to verbalize. Because that Jesus, that's what Jesus got Peter to do, no? Are you going to walk away or not? Click, 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 thinking, 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 thinking. No. Peter had to vocalize, verbalize. You are the Holy One of God. We have believed verbally. So you and I need to speak to others about Jesus and vocalize what we believe. Because that strengthens our faith. You see? And we need to remember that Jesus chose us. Jesus has chosen you when you've trusted Jesus. It's not that you're some great person. It's not that I'm any great person. He said, Jesus chose me. Is then I'm, I'm, am I not the one that chose you? You see? I care for you, and I chose you. Keep following. Keep following. Even though, even though there's going to be trouble ahead. Even though there's going to be hard times ahead. It's going to be so confusing. It's going to be so confusing. One of the twelve, one of the immediate circle of Jesus, betrayed him like that? Yes. Life will be confusing at times. So, <clears throat> have faith in the all-knowing sovereign ways of God Trust in Christ. Um, um, no matter what's happening in your life, in my life, we can be at peace. We can be at peace knowing that God is in it. Wasn't Jesus there when a bunch of disciples left? Wasn't Jesus there when he was betrayed? And Jesus already knew it. When things happen in your life, are happening in your life, and you have no idea, remember, Jesus is in it. Jesus is there. He's working out something. Trust him. Be at peace. Be at peace. Um, then... Another application is, you know, uh, someone said, God has given us this awful ability to choose. It's a, a heavy, heavy thing that we have the ability to choose. We can choose to accept Jesus or reject we have the ability to choose to follow him or not. And some consequences come 5, 20, 30, 50, 100 for eternity decisions that we make. Wow. That's pretty heavy. But God has given you and me the ability to make decisions and we must not be paralyzed by fear that we're going to make a mistake as long as we're turning to God and say Lord I, I want to honor you Lord even if it's a bad decision Lord help it to turn out in the good 
And God says, I'm in it with you. Now, there's some obvious things, moral things that he's already shown us. Don't do that. So it's not a matter of, well, should I commit adultery or not? Uh, you're in it this, Lord. No, no. <laughs> but so much of life is in the gray area. And we have to make decisions. Don't be paralyzed by trying, thinking that you're going to make a mistake. Trust the Lord. He's in it. Move forward. Make a decision. And there's power in making decisions. I mean, it's amazing. We're reflecting God. And you might know of a person who never makes a decision or thinks that they never make a decision. And their life is a mess. And if their life is not a mess, people that are related to that person are maddening. They're mad. They're going crazy because this person will never make a decision. There's power in life, in all of life, in making decisions. And God has given us that ability. As long as we don't, we're going to be tossed back and forth in life. Back and forth. And it seems like life just happens to me. I don't know why, but I'm always in the bad end of the stick. You know? And we blame everybody else when we refuse to make decisions. Um, so make decisions and then you know help others make decisions challenge others you know well where are you why are you you've made some decisions oh no I know something no 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 you made decisions you might have made a decision five years ago that's now just surfacing the consequences are now surfacing you thought that you had made no decision you did make a decision you made a decision not to talk back there. You made a decision not to do what was right back there. You thought that by keeping silent, you were going to get away with not being responsible. No. So encourage others to make decisions. Obviously, moral, godly, towards the Lord, even though sometimes we don't know all the answers. But encourage your children, others, to make decisions. Finally, the greatest one is to trust Jesus. He knows everything and he works in mysterious ways, but his ways are best. Trust the Lord in all of life. He knows everything and his ways are the perfect ways. We can trust, we can believe, we can make that decision to trust him. So let my life